The most terrible thing about the war, I am convinced, is its monuments. The awful things we are compelled to build to remember the victims. In the South particularly, human ingenuity has been put to it to explain on its war monuments the Confederacy. Of course, the plain truth of the matter would be an inscription something like this, sacred to the memory of those who fought to perpetuate human slavery. But that reads with increasing difficulty as time goes on. It does, however, seem to be overdoing the matter to read on a North Carolina Confederate monument, Died Fighting for Liberty. W.E.B. Du Bois, Postscript to the Crisis, August 1931. Such sentiments from a founding member of the AACP should come as no surprise. His readers lived every day in the shadow of a war fought nearly 70 years earlier, Jim Crow oppression growing apace with Las Cause ideology. For activists like Du Bois, correcting the record both historically and physically was an important step on the road to civil rights. But he was far from the only one who felt disrespected by this whitewashed narrative of gentlemanly honor and hazy romance. In contrast to their southern counterparts who were largely members of the agrarian aristocracy, the Union Officer Corps was a relatively diverse and better educated group of men from across the political spectrum. While there were, of course, men with the notorious racist General George B. McClellan, these were offset by the likes of Colonel Josef Fedemeyer, an inner circle Marxist who would be on the far left even in today's political arena. And many of those soldiers who began the war with no opinion on the issue of slavery would change their mind. Now, I was inspired to make this video by a recent find on eBay, namely a 1912 speech delivered by General Thomas Hamlin Hubbard, shortly thereafter elected commander of the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, a fraternal organization comprised of nearly 12,000 former Union officers. Born in 1838, son to a Democrat governor of Maine, Hubbard was by this time a wealthy railroad executive and president of the Puri Arctic Club. Speaking as he did for so many Union veterans, his disapproval of the lost cause and of national homage to the Confederacy is of great interest. Here were his key points. The sufferings and the heroism of the men who fought for the Confederacy were incidents of the contest but were no part of the cause. The ambitions and hopes of its gallant adherents were no part of the cause. Stripped of all sentiment and of the romantic incidents that attended its progress, the cause is seen dedicated to two purposes. The perpetuation of human slavery was one, the dissolution of the Union of the States was the other. The part of the cause that proposed the perpetuation of slavery was undoubtedly lost. No dispassionate thinker, North or South, whose opinion is of weight, would lament the loss or should wish to have the nation commemorated by emblems of respect or honor. The Union was maintained by the Union armies, and the second disastrous purpose of the lost cause failed. Should its loss be deplored? It is probable that the intelligent men of the South would be the first to answer, no. In the progress of events, the South seems to have become the more conservative part of the nation. The Constitution, whose ratification the ordinances of secession attempted to repeal, seems now safe in the keeping of the South. If the lost cause does not deserve the lament or the approval of the nation, is lament or approval or commemoration due from the nation to the leaders of the lost cause? Should statues of Lee or Longstreet or Stonewall Jackson or any of those leaders be erected by the nation or placed on national grounds or buildings? Many of us have estimable and engaging friends who served in the Confederate Army. We wish for them all the good things men wish for their friends, but if monuments are to perpetuate the memory of failure and deserved defeat, some new device must be found to perpetuate the memory of honorable achievement. Granted, this all seems milk and water in today's context, but you have to remember that 1912 also saw President William Howard Taft giving a speech praising the lost cause at the unveiling of the monument to the Confederate dead at Arlington National Cemetery. And that monument still stands today, with a mere wishy-washy qualification on Arlington's website. All of which begs the question, why are there still 700 Confederate monuments in 31 states when there were only 11 Confederate states to begin with? Perhaps those states now passing laws to preserve those monuments to a harmful fable should step back and consider exactly what they are preserving. Du Bois saw it clearly, Union veterans saw it clearly, and so should we. The Southern Poverty Law Center puts it best, quipping, whose heritage?